So it's our honor and privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Kristen Jenke, who is from Boystown Research Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, she is an audiologist uh, by training and then received a PhD at the University of Nebraska, uh, did a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, and now is leading the vestibular research program at Boystown. So thank you for joining us and we look forward to your talk. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. So today I'm going to talk about um, large vestibular aqueduct syndrome and why all third window disorders are um, not created equal. Before that, I thought I'd just give a brief introduction just of myself and kind of what I do at Boys Town um, and just put a small plug in for another study that we're starting um, actually next month um, because we have five years to recruit um, several um, children and um, I'm sort of soliciting anybody that I can to send me um, kids to participate. Um, so just in terms of what I do, I um, am the lead audiologist of clinical vestibular services. We have um, two major hospitals and then a lot of um, smaller outreach centers, uh, but we provide vestibular testing at our two main hospitals, um, five days a week at one hospital and three days a week at the other. Um, so I just sort of oversee our protocols testing, make sure that we are providing just sort of best practice standard of care, answer patient questions, you know, take care of equipment things. Um, so that's a small part of my job. Um, I also see patients um, about one day a week right now that just went down because I received a grant. Um, but I see patients as part of a specialty vestibular clinic. Um, and so our specialty vestibular clinic is a multidisciplinary clinic where patients come in and see um, myself for vestibular testing, um, see audiology for hearing testing, see our physical therapist, and then see our neurotologist, Beth Kelly, um, just so, for sort of holistic care. And then if we need to, we will refer out for, you know, psych and neurology. So I assume that's similar to, to the way patients are being handled um, in your particular facility. Um, one thing that's semi-unique to Boys Town is that we see a large percentage of patients who are children. Um, so our patient caseload is about 50% children and 50% adults. And so we have another multidisciplinary team at Boys Town where um, any child who is newly diagnosed with hearing loss, we typically recommend is seen as part of this multidisciplinary team. Um, so we have a um, care coordinator who helps coordinate all these visits, but the first and third Fridays of the month, Patients will come in and see um, an audiologist for hearing testing, a social worker, a geneticist, an ophthalmologist, um, our pediatric ENT, which is also our um, neuro-ophthalmologist, Beth Kelly, um, a speech-language pathologist, and then I see all of those kids for vestibular testing as well. So we're doing vestibular testing in kids generally starting at about age six months um, and onward. <clears throat> So part of that clinic, um, really for, from my perspective, is just making recommendations. Well, one, determining if those kids do have vestibular loss and then making appropriate referrals for physical therapy to make sure that we're staying on top of any um, gross motor delays. Um, so then I also head up the vestibular imbalance research laboratory. And so our main purpose of the lab is to study the effects of vestibular loss on children. Um, so Boys Town has um, just sort of a longstanding history of studying hearing loss in kids, um, <clears throat> really from understanding um, all different factors from amplification, the amount of amplification, how that affects speech, language, and reading outcomes, but very little has been done to sort of quantify what the effects of vestibular loss um, are on children, specifically school-age kids. So our focus is really on, you know, more obvious things like balance, visual acuity, but we're starting to get into cognition, quality of life, um, and as I'll talk about, some reading outcomes. Um, but when I first started at Boys Town, <clears throat> we really had to understand who, um, you know, in the kids with hearing loss was really at risk for having vestibular loss and whether we needed to be, you know, assessing all children or if we really need to focus our efforts um, just on a small group of children. And then, you know, children are not just small adults. And so there are some uh, methodological things that needed to change when we're you know, testing kids for uh, vestibular impairments. So this was a, pub a paper we published several years ago um, that really solidified in our mind that not all children uh, with hearing loss have vestibular loss. 
So we retrospectively looked at all the kids who had been seen in our pediatric hearing cl clinic, which spans kids who have mild loss to profound loss, <clears throat> and looked at the relationship between degree of hearing loss and degree of vestibular loss. Um, and we primarily used rotary chair as our outcome, as that's an outcome prim or an outcome test that we can use on kids of all ages. Um, but what's shown in the lower left um, corner here is um, that CHL is children with hearing loss, NV is normal vestibular, UVL is unilateral vestibular loss, and BVL is bilateral. Um, but you can see that the majority of the kids who have either unilateral or bilateral loss tend to have um, more severe hearing loss. So typically we... Um, use sort of the cutoff range that if the hearing loss is greater than about 66, then we need to start to be concerned about the presence of vestibular loss in that year. Um, we also ask parents um, the age at which they acquired certain gross motor skills, so sitting independently, and then the age at which the child um, began to walk independently. And as can be seen in the lower right-hand corner, we found that your age to sit and your age to walk um, increased the more severe your vestibular loss was. So typically, if parents are saying that kids are sitting later than about seven months and walking later than about 14 to 15 months, then we need to start being suspicious. So if the hearing of vestibular loss, so if the hearing loss is greater than 65 and they're demonstrating some delays in gross motor function, um, then those are typically kids that we recommend have um, a vestibular evaluation. <clears throat> um, in terms of testing kids, um, kids have smaller ear canals than adults, and so um, some work that we did showed that um, the um, sound pressure levels are higher in their ears, and so that can affect our VEMP outcomes, um, and that's linear related to um, ear canal volume. So that sort of led us to make this sort of gross recommendation that if you're seeing kids who have small ears, i.e. an ear canal volume is zero, less than 0 0.8, that you, for the cochlea's sake, should turn the stimulus down. Um, we were also noting noticing that in children with cochlear implants that we had a large degree of kids who had absent responses. And so one of our initial thoughts was we really just need to make sure that these responses are reliable in kids. So we did a study to determine uh, that determined that air conducted vents are reliable in kids, um, but we were still getting absent responses in the ears with implants. So we did a study um, comparing air conducted to bone conduction responses for VEMPs and found that in ears with normal hearing, our response rates were the same regardless of the stimulus. Um, but in ears with cochlear implants, our stimulus rates or response rates increased when we use bone conduction. Um, and that's simply because when that implant is put in, it does introduce a little bit of an ear bone gap in that middle ear space, which is you know, not an issue um, with kids who have an implant because they're now <clears throat> hearing through that implant. But when you're doing post-op vestibular testing, it does matter um, and can um, give you, uh, I would say, or can decrease your um, air conduction vamp responses, not because of the presence of vestibular loss, but just due to the presence of that CI. So we've now switched to using purely bone conduction um, on our kids with cochlear implants, which led us to do a study to determine if those are reliable in kids and then sort of which method we should be using. Um, and primarily it's because uh, work in adults showed that, that the B71 does not provide enough power to be doing VEMP testing um, on a lot of adults, but surprisingly, we got really reliable results in kids. So typically for kids that are less than 10, we will just use a B71, and then once they get to be older than the age of 10, we'll switch and use um, a mini shaker. So all that to say is, you know, we kind of went through all that to, to make sure that we're doing best practices in terms um, of quantifying the degree of vestibular loss in kids. And that's mainly because we want to know how much vestibular loss a child has and then what the impact of that loss is um, on their everyday life. So adults have, you know, reduced quality of life, dynamic visual acuity, increased falls and balance. And even now there are a variety of studies showing cognitive deficits in adults. So in our lab, our main question is, do children suffer from the same effects of vestibular loss as adults? And overall, the literature to date is showing that, yes, they do, um, but that not all of the effects have really been well established. So <clears throat> there have been several studies that have documented reductions in dynamic visual acuity and even increased in balance, which is typically measured with some sort of measure of gross motor function. 
Um, but there are very few studies right now that are investigating <clears throat> the amount of falls that children are experiencing due to vestibular loss, um, whether or not children are um, evidencing the same cognitive deficits and reductions of quality of life. Um, but there's one other sort of emerging area in kids that isn't necessarily present in adults, and that's whether or not vestibular loss has a significant effect on reading and academic outcomes. And that's something that we're particularly interested in, um, in terms of whether that's something separate or is a trickle-down effect from the reductions in dynamic visual acuity, imbalance, um, or cognition. So <clears throat> as a clinician scientist, you know, when I am counseling families, we talk a lot about um, reductions in gross motor and visual acuity and how the children really need to be plugged into physical therapy, you know, but as a parent who has a child with hearing loss, um, I really don't know like what the impact of that is, you know, most of the efforts are going to be towards rehabilitating that hearing loss and, you know, sure the parents might get the child involved in, in physical therapy, but we're really trying to determine if there's something else that's happening outside of, you know, gross motor and visual acuity deficits that might be affecting um, overall academic performance. And so <clears throat> I received a K grant in December and we are going to be um, investigating the link between um, reading outcomes in kids with vestibular loss. So as part of this study, um, we'll be doing um, a full range of vestibular testing on kids with speech, language, um, cognition, hearing outcomes, and then they'll be doing a variety of reading tests. So um, this is just sort of my plug because we're starting to recruit kids and I really need kids with bilateral vestibular loss. So I'm just putting this plug in here. If you know a child who has a cochlear implant and also has bilateral vestibular loss who falls within the age range of 8 to 14 um, and might want to participate, to please have that family contact me. Um, we will fly families in to participate um, in our study. Uh, we have five years to collect the data, but I'm trying to be very aggressive in our um, recruitment. So I'm just kind of putting this plug in here um, to let you know that we're doing this work and to please send kids to me who you think might be um, good candidates. So with that said, um, that's sort of the main, um, just sort of span of the work that I've been doing in the last 10 years. Um, but I kind of go back to this pediatric hearing clinic because as we were waiting to hear back about this K-23 grant, we had been collaborating with some folks at Boys Town about um, just sort of another avenue of research that also involves children, but in sort of a different way. So um, if I kind of go back to our pediatric hearing clinic, again, our primary emphasis is to diagnose vestibular loss in these kids and make appropriate referrals to physical therapy to sort of help combat the effects of vestibular loss in kids. But um, one additional question I had was whether or not some of the vestibular testing outcomes that we get in terms of this clinic, if that can be useful all to our neurotologist in terms of making an overall diagnosis of the cause of the hearing loss. And so that sort of leads to what I'm mainly going to be talking about today, which is large vestibular aqueduct syndrome um, and sort of what we're learning about why all third window disorders are, are not created equal. <clears throat> so you all are familiar with what a third window disorder is. So on the left hand side, um, we see what's happening in the inner ear in a, in a normal individual. And then on the right hand side is a depiction of what happens um, in individuals who have third window disorders. And today we're primarily going to talk about um, superior canal dehiscence. So when that opening occurs in the superior canal or in large vestibular aqueduct syndrome, when the size um, of that large vestibular aqueduct is enlarged. <clears throat> So what we know is um, in terms of audiometric testing, when we're using an air conducted signal, so what's shown in the top right hand corner, if there is a um, third window disorder, when that air conducted signal passes into the inner ear, um, part of that sound energy is then being released from the ear. And so when we're measuring those thresholds, we're seeing a hearing loss there. Um, if we flip to bone conduction, which is shown in the lower um, right hand corner, uh, we're getting an enhancement of that signal. And so oftentimes in individuals who have third window disorders, we're getting a conductive hearing loss, not of middle ear origin, because that air conductive signal is escaping and then the bone conductive signal is being enhanced. <clears throat> 
Um, so these patients will often have completely normal tympanograms, normal acoustic reflex thresholds. You look in the ear, everything looks great, but the audiogram shows a conductive hearing loss. <laughs> so primarily what we know about third window disorders comes from superior canal to Hissen syndrome. And this slide is really an overgeneralization because, you know, large vestibular aqueduct syndrome has been studied for years. Um, but in the last 15 to 20 years, as um, SCDS has been coined, there's been a lot of work in terms of characterizing um, this overall disorder. And um, much of it, I think, has to do with just the overall characteristics and the age of which the population the individuals are diagnosed. So typically with the Hissen syndrome, as you know, the, there's a nice opening into the superior canal, um, allowing energy transference through there. Most often patients are diagnosed with the Hissens as adults. Um, so typical onset is going to be someone in their 40s. And um, so adults can walk into your exam room, tell you exactly what their symptoms are and in great detail. Um, and then um, is typically diagnosed with a CT scan. An adult will lay in a CT scanner, or most will, um, and allow um, the capture of good images to diagnose whether or not a dehiscence is present. And typically, you're just looking for whether there's an opening there or not. <clears throat> if we switch gears for large vestibular aqueduct syndrome, this is going to affect a distinctly different population. So LVAS is the most common inner ear malformation affecting up to 15% of children with early onset hearing loss. Um, so contradicting dehiscence, which is primarily adults, here we're looking at children and infant children. Um, so age, you know, two days up to um, roughly five and beyond, depending on um, when you see these children in your clinic. So you can imagine that these, you know, these children are going to come in and they're not going to be able to distinctly tell you um, the types of symptoms that they're having, whether or not there's hearing loss there, if they're, you know, noting um, anything in response to pressure changes. Um, <clears throat> and lying still for a CT scan is significantly more difficult as most infants need to be um, sedated. Uh, for a CT scan. Um, the other issue is it's not easy to just look at the um, vestibular aqueduct and determine whether it's enlarged. So there are various published criteria in terms of what's considered um, enlarged. And I think there's a lot of inner subject variability. So we see this a lot in clinic where the neuroradiologist will read the CT, say it's normal. And then the neurotologist will look at it and say, no, I don't think it is, you know, so they'll measure it and have a different opinion. Um, so I think there's a little bit of a gray area in terms of when it's um, considered to be significantly enlarged. Um, and even in some individuals where it is enlarged, hearing can still be normal. So um, it's not necessarily as um, black and white or cut and dry um, as dehiscence in terms of overall um, diagnosis. So for SCDS, um, <clears throat> Brian Ward in 2021 published some um, diagnostic guidelines, um, just sort of outlining um, what patients need to exhibit for a specific diagnosis. So um, individuals need to have at least one of the following symptoms, so bone conduction hyperacusis or hearing, you know, your eyes move, some sort of internal sound. Um, you know, the sound of your own voice is louder. Um, they need to uh, evidence some sort of sound or pressure-induced vertigo or oscillopsia that's time-locked to the stimulus and then be able to describe pulsatile tinnitus. <clears throat> so these are all great because patients can come in and tell you these symptoms. Um, and while these symptoms are not necessarily true to LVAS, um, um, adding some sort of, you know, symptom profile is really difficult, um, again, because it's difficult to query children. Um, for dehiscence, they need to have at least one of the following signs. They need to um, have nystagmus characteristic of excitation or inhibition of the ear, low frequency negative bone conduction thresholds on pure tone audiometry, some sort of enhanced vent responses, and then typically the presence of those things will lead to a high resolution um, CT scan. So, you know, a typical presentation might be somebody who shows up with dehiscence who has a conductive hearing loss in one ear, um, like we see here, where they have a conductive hearing loss in the left ear. <clears throat> and then we will do some um, pressure tests where we will put sound, uh, positive pressure, or ask the patient to Valsalva. And then we're looking for eye movements in the plane of that um, superior canal. So here's an example of a patient that I saw a couple years ago who um, had, you know, time lock, eye movements, and dizziness every time he vocalized really loudly. 
So he, you know, told me every time I yelled do really loud, I feel dizzy. So we were like, okay, can you do that for us today in clinic? And he said, sure. So, um, you know, we asked him to yell really loudly. And as you can see, the eye movements are really quick, but they seem to be um, moving vertically, which, you know, would be consistent with um, a subhere canal dehiscence. Um, he had a conductive hearing loss and hand spams and went on to receive a CT scan and a diagnosis of SCDS. Um, but one of the things we'll typically do, um, you know, our VAMP testing, and I'm sure, you know, everybody that's present here today is familiar with VAMPs. Um, but just sort of a brief overview for VAMP testing, we will put um, electrodes on the sternocleidomastoid muscle um, under the eye. And I will say our electrode montage has changed since we um, ran this video, but this just sort of gives a sense that patients listen to loud clicking sounds and are asked to turn their head and lift or to look up at a target at the ceiling um, while they're listening to, to similar um, clicking sounds. So we're essentially just measuring muscle potential changes at the level of the sternocleidomastoid for cervical vamps, and then at the level of the inferior oblique for um, ocular vamps. Um, the cervical vamp is related to the vestibular colic reflex, is an ipsilateral response, um, and that STM has to be contract because we're measuring a, um, a release of contraction and is essentially giving us information about the sacral inferior nerve as opposed to the ocular vamp, which is related to um, the utricle um, and subhere vestibular nerves and excitatory response. So we have patients look up to bring that inferior oblique muscle to the surface and we're measuring a, a contraction of that muscle. <clears throat> so VAMPs are excellent screening tools for dehiscence syndrome, which has been documented over the last, um, I'd say 10 to 15 years. So typically what we'll see in dehiscence are large cervical vamp, or excuse me, low cervical vamp thresholds. Um, and there was just recently a paper that was put out um, this year that showed that 75 is a good cutoff. Um, high or enhanced ocular vamp amplitudes and our amplitude cutoffs vary because we've changed our electric, our, excuse me, our um, electrode montage several times in the last few years, but Generally, once um, amplitudes get in the 20 to 30 range, you're kind of uncertain, but you're suspicious of dehiscence. And then once it's above 30, highly suspicious. And then um, in looking at frequency tuning curves um, of ears with dehiscence, we see really wide tuning in these ears, which means that we can use um, high frequency stimuli to also um, assess VAMP testing. So there have been several investigators that have shown that we can take advantage of this broad frequency tuning, um, where if you do an ocular vamp that looks suspicious, you know, 500 hertz, then we increase the, the frequency to two or 4k hertz and look for the presence of um, and vamp. And if it's there, then that's also highly indicative of, um, of dehiscence syndrome. So our main question is, or my own personal question, so I'm going to just talk today about some very, you know, preliminary data that we have um, collected at Boys Town as part of a much larger study investigating LVAS. Um, but what we wanted to know is whether or not similar to dehiscence, can VEMP testing be used as a screening tool for LVAS? So we know that these two represent you know, varying populations, um, <clears throat> but oftentimes it's helpful if you see something that's enhanced in clinic to help drive that decision toward a CT scan. So we wanted to know if there were distinct differences between these two populations in terms of their overall VEMP outcomes. Um, and if they're not, what are some potential sources of variability? Um, so <clears throat> as you know, LVAS diagnosis does require um, a CT. Um, in young children. Um, CTs are, you know, costly, time-consuming, can come with significant risks, such as um, the need for sedation, um, but generally requires some level of suspicion for LVAS. Um, so typically, you'll need some sort of audiometric test, some sort of report of hearing loss progression, um, and what can be really difficult, as we'll talk about, is as many as 50 to 60 percent of children who have LVAS pass their newborn hearing screening. <clears throat> so we did a retrospective review of um, individuals who were diagnosed with LVAS at Boys Town. Um, so what we see on the right-hand side um, is a depiction of 55 years from our clinical population. Um, the mean age at the initial audiometric evaluation was five years. Um, 
we cut the cohort into two. So the open circles on the right hand side will show the ears that referred on newborn hearing screening. And then the closed circles show what happens if the um, individual has passed. And so there are sort of two trends that you can get from this data. One is that those who refer on testing obviously have more severe hearing loss. And those are the kids who are going to um, be gravitating towards getting a cochlear implant right away. As opposed to individuals who pass their newborn hearing screen, you can see there's a wide variability in the overall degree of their hearing loss. Um, but more importantly, most of those kids are not being picked up until at least age five, if not later. <clears throat> and some of that stems from um, just the inability to determine who has LVAS based on the audiogram itself. And so that's sort of um, why we're wondering if VEMPS can be helpful here to um, solidify who has LVAS from the get-go. Um, there's also going to be this delay from diagnosing hearing loss and to moving kids um, to getting a CT scan. <clears throat> um, but essentially what we found is that 58% of our kids pass their newborn hearing screening which is a significant amount of numbers, um, and that those who passed tended to have um, lower degrees of hearing loss. Um, and so we're also longitudinally looking at these kids to see um, if there are differences and how long it took for them to um, overall need a, a cochlear implant. Um, but overall, we speculate that there are likely differences between individuals who pass their newborn hearing screening and those who refer that could be related um, to just the underlying genotype. All right. Um, so hearing loss with LVAS is progressive. And so again, early diagnosis is, is critical. Um, these are just a few different um, audiograms <clears throat> here that show that the type of hearing loss and the rate of progression can be variable. So these are three individuals who have um, large vestibular aqueduct syndrome. And you can see that just the overall character when you look at them is very different. So there isn't <clears throat> one audiometric profile that fits individuals with LVAS. I would say the only common denominator looking at all of these is that they all demonstrate some degree of a conductive hearing loss. Um, <clears throat> this is an example of one patient who showed progressions. And again, the progressions can be very different. So some kids are born with severe to profound hearing loss and need a cochlear implant right away. Some are born with normal hearing. And I would say most children demonstrate different rates of progression. So um, we have an audiogram from 2011. Um, then five years later, we see a progression of hearing loss just in the high frequencies in that right ear. And then two months later, the patient comes back, excuse me, in the left ear and hearing in the left ear is completely gone. Um, so this is just to demonstrate that progression can vary um, both within and between um, subjects. So unfortunately, the overall pathophysiology of LVAS isn't currently understood. And again, this is going to be a really general slide. You could do a whole talk on just the underlying pathophysiology of LVAS. But essentially, there are likely a couple different things happening. So unlike the hissense, which is mainly just a purely conductive hearing loss, LVAS has an um, underlying sensory neural hearing component. So one hypothesis is that the conductive component is likely related to that large vestibular aqueduct, which um, essentially results in this conductive hearing, but that the sensory neural component could be um, resulting from a high drops like effect like Meniere's disease, which causes increased pressure in the membranous labyrinth and a decrease in stapes mobility. Um, and damage to the inner ear structures. This can also vary because um, LVAS is related to different underlying genotypes. And so it has been related to mutations in three different genes among others. So there can be a lot of variability. Um, individuals with LVAS can also have a lot, an enlarged vestibular aqueduct in isolation, or it can be um, in the presence of other inner ear um, anomalies. And enlargement of that um, aqueduct size can also vary. So essentially, um, individuals with LVAS really represent a very heterogeneous population whose phenotype is rapidly changing over time because we're seeing um, large progressions in hearing. Um, and there are some questions about whether or not we see similar rapid progressions, um, you know, in the vestibular um, side of things. So kind of going back to VEMP testing, now we wanted to know if VEMPs can be used similarly as a screening tool for large vestibular aqueduct syndrome. Um, we are not the first people to think about doing VEMPs. There have been a variety of manuscripts out there who have documented VEMP findings um, in individuals with LVAS. But there are a couple of different things 
um, that we noted. One is that there are a lot of um, conflicting findings regarding the overall outcomes. Um, so some individuals will say that the responses are enhanced, some have reported absent responses, and some have reported completely normal responses in this patient population. Um, <clears throat> when they are enhanced, few studies have really investigated the sensitivity and specificity of VEMP in diagnosing um, LVAS. Um, we had talked about how this, you know, rapidly changes over time, and so a few studies have also looked at um, age as a covariate here to see if these rapid progressions are changing the way these responses look. Um, and, you know, our sort of hope is that they look the best in children when they're young, so we can use this as a screening tool. Um, <clears throat> but again, that hasn't been investigated. Um, the other thing that's come out of the literature in the last five to 10 years is that a few studies have really rigorously studied normal properties of VEMP testing um, in children until really just the last few years. Um, so you really have no idea what the sensitivity and specificity of these outcomes are if you don't know what's happening um, in normal kids. So the purpose of this study was to preliminarily determine the sensitivity and specificity of air and bone conducted cervical and ocular VEMPs for identifying LVAS. Um, and when I agreed to kind of talk about this several months ago, I thought we were going to be starting our data collection much sooner. Um, we actually have some data collected, but we're still in the throes of collecting data. So I'm just going to talk to you today about who we've seen so far. Um, so we're recruiting kids who have radiographically diagnosed um, LVAS. And so at this point, we have um, 12 years, five with CI, which we're kind of just throwing out. Um, so spanning the range of age 10 to 33. And at this point, we're not turning anybody away regardless of age because um, we want to investigate um, sort of age as a covariate. And then we have some age matched um, normal controls. Everybody is receiving tympanometry and then we're doing cervical and ocular vent testing in response to both air conduction stimulation and bone conduction vibration. Um, so this is sort of our busy slide of our data. We have um, on the left-hand side, um, our responses to air conduction stimulation and on the right-hand side, responses to mini shaker. <clears throat> and we've divided everybody up into normal controls, LVAS with a CI and LVAS without a CI. And we're primarily interested in what's happening in those ears that do not already have a cochlear implant placed. Um, in terms of overall group differences, um, our hypothesis was that we would see enhanced responses regardless of stimulation um, so for both CVEMPs and OVEMPs in response to air conduction and bone conduction. Um, we did not get group differences for air conduction, but we did see group differences uh, for many shaker stimuli, um, although they were not in the direction that we had thought. So what we see here are groups on the bottom, our normal controls, our um, LVAS with CI, and then our LVAS without a CI, and then in blue is air conduction, and in red is our, or, yeah, blue is air, B, uh, red is bone. And uh, what we see is a significant reduction in overall bone conduction responses um, just in the ears with LVAS and not a CI. And so we were really quite surprised by this. Um, so when we moved to ocular REM, so we kind of got the opposite. Um, so here we got our hypothesized um, effect where we see in our ears with LVAS an enhanced ocular REM response. Um, that's larger than those with normal hearing or in our normal control ears, um, but we still are seeing that reduced response to bone conduction stimuli, which was really quite surprising. So overall, our ears with LVAS are showing significantly lower bone conduction CVEMP amplitudes um, and um, OVEMP amplitudes with significantly higher ocular VEMP amplitudes. So next we ran some ROC curves just to determine how sensitive each of these findings are for diagnosing individuals with LVAS and by and large ocular vents provide the most best separation. So our ROC curves are 0.914. If we had a one, that would mean that we have got perfect separation. In terms of our other outcomes, the cervical vent provided actually not I would say pretty good separation between um, our normal controls and those with um, LVAS. Um, although the responses that are consistent with LVAS are just that they're low. Uh, <clears throat> and then some you know, mediocre findings with the ocular VEMP. Although I, I, if I were doing ocular VEMP, I'd stick with air conduction here. 
Um, but one thing uh, or a couple things regarding the, our overall sensitivity and specificity um, are that none of these data really capture the differences that we're seeing between air conduction and bone conduction where we're having high air and very low bone. Um, so we wanted to know if there was any um, clinical utility in comparing these responses. So if you, you know, compute a ratio in an individual who has a normal ear, if your air matches your bone, you'd have a ratio of one. And then if you do a ratio in an individual who has LBAS and you have a high air and a low um, bone, then your ratio should be significantly different than someone who has um, normal hearing. So <clears throat> we opted not to compute ratios because some individuals with LVAS just didn't have bone conduction responses. And so um, that's a difficult, um, so ratios can kind of skew your data a little bit. So we decided just to subtract our air conduction amplitudes from our bone conduction amplitudes. And this is what our data look like here. Um, and so you can see here that uh, OVEMP now is in blue, CVEMP amplitude is in red, and our CVEMP amplitude corrected amplitude is in uh, green. And here we're getting really good separation between the groups. And if we look at our bone conduction, or excuse me, our um, difference between air and bone for OVEMP, we get perfect separation between the groups. And so we can um, identify who has LVAS really just based on this pattern of findings and then um, comparing the differences between the two. Um, and our abilities with um, CVEMP really aren't, aren't terrible, but they're not perfect, um, but might be really a good place to start. Um, and so here's just an example of some data. So this is someone I actually saw in clinic like a month ago um, who we didn't know at the time had LBAS. Um, you know, you look at this audiogram and the air bone gaps are, you know, they're present, but they're not, um, I don't think really impressive, particularly because a lot of them um, represent some vibrotactile responses. So I don't think you'd look at this and say, oh, this is a, a really impressive air bone gap. Um, but when we did his VEMP um, testing, we got really beautiful air conduction responses that look really wonderful. And then we got really horrible bone conduction responses. So if this was a sensory neural hearing loss, I would anticipate that bone conduction would equal air conduction. Um, and if this was a true um, air bone gap <clears throat> that was related to a middle ear disorder, I would anticipate the opposite where air conduction would look poor and bone conduction would actually look really good. So immediately when I saw this patient, I thought this, you know, this is not typical. This has to represent, you know, large vestibular aqueduct syndrome. And sure enough, um, after the CT and MRI had been completed, um, cause he was a candidate for, um, a CI, I think he's like 18 or 19. Um, you know, he showed large vestibular aqueducts, aqueduct syndrome. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're sort of continuing to investigate this. We have several more subjects that we're going to run to determine if the same pattern of findings um, is present. <clears throat> so to sort of answer a question, can VEMP testing be used as a screening tool for LVAS? I would say that air conduction, cervical VEMP amplitude wasn't really that helpful. Um, it isn't necessarily helpful in dehiscence syndrome either. So I wasn't really surprised by that. Um, bone conduction cervical vamp testing demonstrates pretty good sensitivity and specificity and could be an option for younger children um, so long as normal responses are really well defined um, in an age matched way. Um, an ocular vamp amplitude was really consistent, um, or excuse me, an enhanced ocular vamp um, amplitude um, was present in this patient population, which is consistent with dehiscent syndrome. Um, Interestingly, though, contrary to ears with dehiscence, we saw a reduction in overall bone conduction. And so we're not really sure what to make of this in terms of what's causing that reduction um, in overall amplitude for bone conduction. Um, you know, we imagine this represents some sort of physiological change. The opening to the cavity is in a different spot, which is going to change the overall um, resonant properties you know, of the um, canal, but I really, or of the um, inner ear, but I really thought that the um, vestibular system would respond pretty equally to bone conduction um, and air conduction. So here are just a couple of slides documenting in 
enhancement of VEMP outcomes in patients with the Hisson syndrome. So um, what we see on the left or healthy side um, are, you know, normal amplitudes. And then when we look at the affected side on the right, um, we see that those amplitudes are enhanced. <clears throat> I had to go back to the literature just to make sure that I was remembering um, correctly. So I spent a year at Hopkins and all I did that whole year was see nothing but patients with dehiscent syndrome. And I swear that they had enhanced responses. So I had to go back and make sure that I wasn't like remembering incorrectly or making things up. But sure enough, you know, in the literature, there's plenty of um, papers out there documenting enhanced responses. So Manzari in 2012 show, you know, these enhanced responses to bone conduction and dehiscence. And then this was a paper that I wrote as well in 2013, where we had almost near perfect separation um, of uh, amplitudes in individuals with dehiscence syndrome. And so um, I was a little disappointed when going through our data that we were seeing these reductions in bone conduction. And primarily that's because this group in Belgium is really pushing for a vestibular infant screening. And so they've set up this program where individuals, or excuse me, where kids who fail their newborn hearing screening come back for an ABR re-screen to um, solidify that the hearing loss is present and then automatically get a bone conduction cervical vamp at the time to test for vestibular loss. And if the bone conduction cervical vamp is absent, then at age 12 months, they come back for V-hit testing and or rotary chair. Um, and so we've been interested in understanding how this sort of fits into our um, current protocol. Um, overall, you know, just with all kids with hearing loss, but particularly with kids with LVAS, I thought, well, if um, kids with LVAS show enhanced responses similar to VEMPS or similar to dehiscent syndrome, this is a really great way to pick these kids up early and then follow them longitudinally. Um, so when I saw that the responses were actually lower, I was really disappointed because it's not that they're, you know, necessarily absent in everyone. And a lot of people, they're just a little bit low, um, which doesn't necessarily qualify you as having, um, you know, vestibular loss. Um, <clears throat> so some other things that we're sort of investigating is whether maybe we don't need to be paying attention to amplitudes, but if there are some differences in latency. So there have been a couple of papers you have, you know, documented, you know, on the right hand side, this was a paper by I think Rachel Taylor out of Australia, who showed that depending on where you put the stimulation for dehiscence, you start to see some latency differences where you get some delays. Um, and then the data on the left-hand side are data in kids with LVAS where we start to see some, some latency delays as well. Um, so uh, again, the latency delays were not present in our current data, but may reflect some differences just in children, which is another reason why age really needs to be considered as a covariate um, when looking at these outcomes. Um, you know, we have a question as to whether or not um, ears with LVAS demonstrate similar frequency tuning uh, or broad frequency tuning as individuals with dehiscence syndrome. So on the left-hand side, um, our data representing ears with um, dehiscence that show really wide frequency tuning. And then we have a little bit of pilot data on the right-hand side in ears with LVAS, and we're seeing that there is not that broad frequency tuning, that it's really um, narrow, like ears, um, excuse me, like normal control ears, but with some enhancements um, in overall amplitudes. So just to sort of summarize um, our, you know, overall question, can, to, can VEMP testing be used as a screening tool for LVAS? Um, I feel like in order to officially answer this question, we need more data and we need data that span children from age six months um, up to adults looking at um, overall the effects of age um, as this disease sort of progresses. Um, at present time, I would say that um, enhanced ocular vamps seem to do the best job at separating, and we can typically do ocular vamps in children as early as age three, um, but that I would stick with um, air conduction over bone conduction. And if the child didn't want to participate in ocular vamps, you could try cervical vamps. And if you did that, you'd want to focus primarily on responses um, to bone conduction. Um, our data collection is ongoing. We're collecting data all summer, um, and then we're hoping to sort of round this up and, um, and then kind of 
switch our focus. <clears throat> but again, we're looking um, for kids of all, all ages. Um, this is just a small piece of a much larger study where we're um, <clears throat> overall characterizing um, this group and then looking for other sources of variability. Um, age is one that we had talked about primarily today that I, you know, anticipate is largely affecting VEMP responses, um, but we're also looking at size of the VA, um, other uh, abnormalities that could be occurring um, with the with the inner ear, and then also the type of genetic mutation that they have. Um, so our sort of long-term goal is to develop screening tools for the early identification of LVAS, so we can take the um, initial time of ID, which is roughly five and beyond, um, and push that back a little bit, um, and then really allow the ability to longitudinally study the course of disease um, and, you know, eventually potentially develop some sort of um, treatments for these kids. But that's, you know, sort of our, our big dream down the road. So, you know, are all third window disorders created equal? I would say no. You know, LVAS obviously represents a different uh, patient population where we're looking more like at children. Both LVAS and CT are diagnosed with, or excuse me, both LVAS and SCDS are diagnosed with CT scans, um, with CT scans being, you know, a little bit more difficult to achieve in a child. Um, both of these patient populations present with air bone gaps, but LVAS has the added component of having a sensory neural hearing loss that's changing over time. Um, and while both of them show some enhancements to, um, to vent responses, it looks like LVAS is showing a little bit of a, of a different um, pattern of findings. So because we're in the preliminary stages, um, I would really appreciate feedback from you all in terms of whether or not a screening protocol for LVAS, you know, would even be beneficial. And then I've been kind of scouring the data to try to um, explain why we're getting a difference between air conduction and bone conduction. Um, you know, and what I've read is that the enhanced VEMP responses in dehiscence are really related to the recruitment or activation of the superior canal um, afferent neurons, but we're seeing, you know, activation of these in response to both air and bone. And so I'm trying to explain why we're seeing this difference. And so if anybody has any recommended um, just explanation for this findings. Um, I'd really appreciate your input. Um, but that's really all I have for you today. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for your time and attention. Hello, my name is Dr. Kevin Peng, neurotologist here at the House Institute. Thank you for watching this video. The House Institute provides free educational videos for hearing health professionals worldwide. To help support videos like these and other educational efforts, please consider donating by clicking the link in the description box below. Your generous support allows us to keep videos like these at no cost for you and others. Thank you.